Good morning, ladies, gentlemen, friends, colleagues, and anybody who's listening in. Um, we've got another episode now, and uh, it's a lovely opportunity to listen to somebody who explains a success story. And from his backdrop, you can see it's take off and landing. It's Adam Twiddell, who's the founder of Private Fly and also the CEO. So, Adam, thank you very, very much for joining us this morning. Hi, Chris. Pleasure. It's, it's a lovely backdrop, my friend. Well, it's, it's very uh, funny. As we've all got used to working on Zoom, a lot of people think this is just one of those fancy Zoom backgrounds. But if I move my camera a little bit, you'll see that it's our meeting room. And uh, we've, we've got some passionate um, team members who are all really aviation geeks at heart. So it was, it was pretty important to us that we made a bold statement in the, in the boardroom. Certainly is, certainly is. It's always good that, well, from anything to do with business, it's always exciting with takeoff and also exciting with a safe landing. So brilliant. Now, Adam, what we'd like to do, everybody's aware of the challenges that uh, especially our industry has got now and COVID-19 and it's uh, been such a shock and a terrible thing hitting the entire world. But what we want to start doing as well is we want to start now bringing some positivity back in and letting people see that, you know, there is, there is a way out. There is a, a certain set of opportunities and alternatives moving forward and your success story is definitely something that's worth listening to so the magic of business aviation and the ceo's vision obviously it started somewhere and i understand it was 12 years ago with yourself and and uh, and your wife and you made a huge sacrifice to get it started so maybe just give us a little bit of background so we can see how committed you were at that time well, I fell in love with aviation when I was at uh, Edinburgh University. I joined the University Air Squadron and uh, had the, had the um, great fortune of being um, taught to fly when, and fitting in those between my lectures. Uh, and when I graduated, uh, a job in engineering didn't look half as much fun as a job in the Air Force. So I, I joined the, the, the Air Force and had 10 really happy years flying. Um, I flew the Hercules. Well, oh, nice one. Wasn't good enough to fly anything fast, so they gave me uh, something nice and uh, slow with lots of people around me, Chris, to, to look after me. Well, it's still very, what a great experience. Uh, and then after leaving the Air Force, um, I wasn't ready to join the airlines, um, and I was introduced to the world of private aviation, which I just had not heard about uh, much before. Um, so I, I joined uh, um, a fractional airline, NetJets, and started flying private jet passengers. So instead of throwing my passengers out on, on parachutes, I started serving them champagne and taking them to business meetings. My wife, uh, Carol, meanwhile, um, was um, having a very successful ke career in the magazine industry, um, working uh, with um, companies such as Condé Nast uh, on launching magazines um, like Condé Nast Traveler, um, and so she knew the, the travel industry, the luxury uh, travel industry well. She, um, she knew about marketing. Yeah. Uh, and over a few glasses of, of wine, um, we started talking about this gap in the market that I had seen for bringing private jet pricing and private jet bookings online because nobody was um, empowering the customer or, or um, to be able to see all of the options. It's a very fragmented marketplace. Yeah. Uh, thousands of aircraft available to charter, um, hundreds of aircraft operators, um, uh, and then a very traditional world of brokers in the middle. And we wanted to really do what had happened in so many other industries, and especially in travel. We wanted to bring it online, allowing um, customers to, to enter in itineraries, see pricing instantly, and be able to compare options and book all the way through online if they wanted to, or um, have experts on hand um, to help them through the process so that was our that was our um, midlife crisis as I would describe it so we we sold the house um, that we we lived in here in St Albans and we put the the, the proceeds from the house sale into building the code um, I, I guess we were all in at that stage I'm sure when you started when, when your good lady listens listens to this podcast and you started with I fell in love with I bet she was just ah. about to think, what a lovely fella. And then you went on to aviation. So, but a, what a great sacrifice and a great story. Now, starting up and obviously, you know, looking, looking ahead, you must have thought to yourself, what can I do differently? 
So what sort of areas did you focus on to sort of ease yourself in, but also um, I would imagine, and even for myself, I, you know, it's something that you don't readily think of private aviation, you know, chartering an aircraft or seeing what's, what's available. But now with the situation that everybody's in, I'm sure people are going to start looking at things a lot more differently now because of the obvious advantages of fewer people, you know, less queues, but that wouldn't have been something that you would have looked at at the beginning. So what were the areas that you really wanted to focus on at the beginning? Well, uh, I think overall, um, we were perhaps fortunate to be completely naive about what we were letting ourselves in for. We hadn't, uh, you know, done a business degree. We hadn't uh, done an MBA. We hadn't um, ex had launched a company before. And here we were, um, sold the house and started uh, building the code. And the, and the immediate problem was, how are you going to find customers? Because the, the high net worth, the, the corporates who are, who are flying their boards, they're not easy to get meetings with. They've got... Yeah gatekeepers um, they don't publish their their details um, easily for you to just phone up and sell them something um, so the the plan right from the very beginning was that we wanted to to make private aviation accessible to the travel industry who already had customers who were probably purchasing um, uh, flights on on private jets but not through them so we worked with um, concierge services like 10 we've had a long-standing partnership with the uh, with 10 white yeah. concierge. Um, we worked with airports like the Manchester Airport Group, white labeling our technology so that anybody who just missed a flight or was searching for an airline, which um, could perhaps um, fly them direct when there was only um, airlines which could um, have to go via a, a different hub um, for two flights. So we wanted to um, find the customers through, through partnerships. And that was, that was, um, Probably the first thing we did differently. Oh, that's brilliant. And they say a leader, a leader who who um, is one who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. So when you started to map it all out, did you have did you have specific um, sectors? Did you have specific like uh, products or or offerings that you wanted to focus on, and then obviously gauge the success of each to see which one you carried on with? Well, as a platform, um, I always. Um, saw that we had two two customers. One, the client who was booking the trip, and the other was the aircraft operators who are our supply chain. Yeah. Um, and, and I really wanted to be a friend of both um, and raise both sides up in equal proportion. Um, so on, in terms of um, building a platform for the clients, we just wanted to empower them. We wanted to educate the private jet customer about what happened behind the scenes of private aviation, Ex explaining things. Uh, we're lucky that um, we're in an industry that many people are fascinated with. Yeah, um, yeah. So we wanted to take off the covers and just show everybody how it works, talk about aircraft. And really, um, when we hired people, we wanted them to be passionate about the product that they were selling. So. In, in a sense, everything um, we designed um, was for the client. And that's right down to the, the usability of the, the website, um, how, we, how we spoke to clients on the telephone, how we would have honest, transparent values, um, always giving customers bad news early. Um, if they were getting an upgrade, well, that's good news, and that can wait a while. Just, but we yeah. always wanted to be very, make sure that we were being transparent um, to, to clients um, right from the very beginning. Um, in terms of payment, um, we, wanted we wanted customers to choose how they would pay us. So um, of course, um, that involved credit cards. Um, a third of our flights are actually booked by credit cards, which is surprising for, for many people to hear. Um, but we, we went on to um, work with Bitcoin, for example, because one of our customers um, had an excellent experience all the way through. We ask clients to review us on Trustpilot, a review yeah. site. Um, and reading a review, the, the client said that uh, everything was perfect. The only thing we could improve was our payment process by accepting Bitcoin. So I looked into Bitcoin, and at the time it was... Um, perhaps um, viewed as CD in the underworld. Um, but the more I read, the more I realized actually um, 
why shouldn't we do this? If customers want to pay by Bitcoin, the, the fees were lower, the, the speed of the transaction, the lack of uh, chargebacks, um, which were prevalent in, in the credit card world. Um, so we, we, we pushed wherever the customer wanted us to go. Um, and then in terms of the aircraft operator, we wanted to help them sell more flights. And we saw that many of their processes in quoting um, were, were somewhat um, lacking in development. So we built a platform which um, integrated with the scheduling software. We, we worked with whatever scheduling software the aircraft operators used, and we started tracking the aircraft, pinpointing yeah. for our customers, where not just in real time, but in the future, aircraft were planned to be. Um, one of the holy grails of um, private aviation is to minimize the empty sectors. Because exactly, yeah. Like, yeah. A, like a taxi, a private jet will drop passengers off and then fly um, to pick up the next set. And, and everybody wants to mi minimize that. If we could, we wouldn't have any empty sectors at all. Um, yeah. So uh, integrating the technology with the aircraft operators and, and speeding up their quoting process um, um, was, was a key um, point of difference. Yeah, no, we did, a, we did a show with a company called Hello, or Hello, and uh, where they, they organized crews to yeah. ma ma match up with the aircraft. Again, same thing to make sure that, you know, there's no wasted legs or there's no redundancy of time for the, for the crews. It's a, a little bit like Airbnb in the air. It's uh, incredible. And I think uh, re recruitment sites for, um, uh, for freelance pilots will probably be yeah. um, in high demand at the moment as, as um, all aircraft operators cut back to the bone, but then have the occasional needs um, to, to fly. So it's, it's been great to see that sort of entrepreneurial spirit from, from the recruitment side of things. Yeah, no, it's really, uh, it, it opens your eyes and it makes you think, you know, how, what, why, why people have been sort of a little bit laid back and stayed, which is obviously complacency. And something like this virus has made people, you know, start thinking of new things, you know, cut down on admin and bureaucracy and be faster with making decisions, which is a great thing. Now, if I was, if I wanted to, if I wanted to get involved or I wanted to give it a try, obviously there's different ways. I can just go online, I can look and I can say, right, I want to go from here to here. And if there's an opportunity, I just pay and I fly. So yeah, that's, that's, that's where that's, private flight predominantly sits is in the, the on-demand charter world. So spot charter, um, yeah. exactly as you described it. Um, we do have a, a product now um, called a jet card. And yeah. A jet card um, will allow you to have um, certainty of pricing for, for the year ahead. Um, because in the on-demand world, every trip is unique and the yeah. aircraft operators will quote um, for the, the flying and the landing fees, um, the handling fees, the crew expenses, and that all comes together in a charter quote. Um, but if you want guaranteed pricing and guaranteed availability, then the jet card product is, is the next level up. Normally sold in 25 hours, um, and uh, there, are, there are numerous companies. In fact, um, one of our sister companies now um, is Sentient Jet Charter, um, and in the States, they have 6,000 customers who have 25-hour jet cards. So that makes them the largest um, uh, the company globally for, for jet cards. So we, we, we learned a thing or two from our elder um, sister, and uh, we've implemented a jet card within Private Fly. That's great then. So, so you could actually get smaller little um, air clubs or, or people pulling together and, and uh, securing those cards. Yeah, it tends to be for somebody who, who knows they need to fly a set amount per year uh, and like buying fuel. They, they yeah. don't want to um, buy all of their trips um, on demand. They, they want to have some certainty. In fact, the really um, savvy customers now are, are doing exactly that. They're, they're mix, mixing and matching, whereas before they might have bought um, 50 hours um, from a fractional provider like NetJets but they realize actually that's a very expensive way to fly um, and they'll maybe just buy 25 hours this year um, and half of their flying will be in the charter world, half of it in the, in the jet card and, and mix and match. 
So we, we've actually seen the, the private jet customer get very smart over the last five years. That's, yeah, no, I can imagine. And, and I, w- I would think now, and, and obviously you guys would be uh, quite positive about it, you're going to get an awful lot more interest now because of what's happened. Well, so, this, is, um, this is what's exactly what's happening in the market at the moment. You know, as when in February, when the, the virus started spreading to Europe, um, March, the restrictions started locking down travelers, um, deadlines were approaching, and we, we saw a surge in demand for private aviation to fill the gaps where the airlines weren't flying, or indeed people were beginning to get worried about um, the virus on board aircraft and through passenger terminals. So they were returning to private aviation. Then we've seen a couple of months of, of it being pretty slow here in Europe. Um, but out of the blocks came America first, a much bigger domestic market. So yeah, yeah. Um, our team in the States, we've got an office in Fort Lauderdale and in Boston. Um, they've been incredibly busy over the last six weeks um, flying Americans. Um, uh, and uh, there's been a lot of leisure travel, but also businesses are now trying to get back up and realizing that if they have to travel, how do they, how do they ask their employees to fly? Um, the liability issue, especially in the States, is, is significant. Um, so we're seeing um, businesses who, who do need to travel starting to book private jets. And what's very interesting is the number of new clients coming in. Over the, over the last year or so, we would have had 25% of our clients as new and 75% returning clients. That sort of ratio um, yeah. as we expand the business. But it's, it's almost completely flipped. Um, in May, 63% of our customers were new. Um, and interestingly, we're not just seeing new customers come direct um, in through charter because what historically would happen with, with private aviation is somebody would fly on a trip with work or with the friends, they would then book a, an, an on-demand trip, a charter trip um, for their next family holiday or their next business trip. And then they would eventually grow into being a jet card customer. Yeah. Um, the next level after jet card, incidentally, is fractional ownership, where you actually buy a share of an aircraft. Um, and then eventually some of those, it's a pyramid, of course, but so some you get your of own aircraft. Grow on, and yes, they would buy their, their own aircraft. Um, but what, what is really interesting is that the new customers coming into the market aren't just coming into charter, they're coming into jet cards and indeed fractional as well. So we're seeing um, people who've always had the means to travel by private jet, but for whatever reasons decide not to, um, suddenly jump into the market at their appropriate level. And yeah. indeed, uh, a McKinsey study um, recently said that of the, the people with means, only 10% have been flying private um, privately before. Yeah, but I think I think now with with certain restrictions that are going to have to come in, um, and people are going to have to accept it, and then and then even more regulatory criteria with regards to hygiene, which is necessary anyhow. I think that's been long overdue. Yeah. Um, but all of those issues and then restrictions and limitations, etc. It's going to make people, you know, think to themselves: Do I really want to go that far? Do I really want to go through this this hassle, etc. And I think it's a real, it's a great alternative. And I would imagine, um, I would imagine, you know, hookups with exclusive holiday locations will become more popular. Um, maybe even hookups with carriers because they're going to get their own business and first class numbers reduced. So I, th- I think it's an incredible opportunity out there. Yeah, you're certainly going to be um, exposed to a, a, a much reduced risk by flying by private aviation. At, at certain airports, your car can go straight to the aircraft steps um, where you'll um, be um, go through security um, as, as you enter onto the aircraft. Other, other airports like, uh, for example, here in, in London, Luton, um, they will have two different private jet terminals and you will be the only person traveling through that at that time. Um, uh, and then straight out to the to the aircraft and indeed on board the aircraft our aircraft have been um, cleaned um, with products um, such as microshield which yeah. kill the virus for up to two weeks after each trip the aircraft then cleaned again um, our crew um, in, in the states aren't actually flying by airlines anymore um, 
on our family fleet, um, so they're, they're not being exposed. Um, the crew would previously have welcomed you um, as you stepped outside of your car and they would have shaken your hands and escorted you through the airport. That's not happening now. Um, the first time you'll see your captain is at the aircraft. Um, she's certainly not going to shake hands with you as she welcomes you on board the, the, the aircraft. The pilots are going to keep very much to themselves uh, at the front of the aircraft. And indeed, on, on some of the smaller aircraft where we do not need to have a, a flight attendant or, yeah. or a cabin server, we're removing them. Um, so you're, you're on board the private jet. You're going to, it's going to be just you and your, your party. Um, you're, you're not going to have any third parties. And then the whole thing when you land is just seamlessly to your car in a way. So the, 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 the amount of risk to COVID-19 is significantly reduced. Of course, this comes with the additional benefit of you choose when you want to um, uh, depart and at what time. And if you're doing a return trip, the aircraft's not going to leave without you. It's, it's your aircraft. So there's flexibility. But of course, you know, we're not talking about EasyJet and Ryanair pricing here. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. It's always going to cost more. Um, it's just a question of, uh, is, the, is, is the, the customer now prepared to pay more um, for that added, added security? Perhaps the leisure traveler is not flying as often. Families aren't going to be doing five, six holidays a year. They're just going to be doing one or two. So they'll, well, they'll spend more on those individual um, flights. But to your point, Chris, I think absolutely the travel agent um, who has been forced uh, into a narrowing world of commissions uh, yeah. is, is now able to sell an additional product just to get their customer going. Um, and to cover everything, yeah, exactly. Now, with that, you, you, you mentioned the word there, risk. And obviously, that's one of the things that most of the industry is fully aware of because of the, the regulatory criteria, the compliance issues, etc. But as far as doing effective risk assessments and business continuity focus, etc., they were a little bit remiss with regards to, you know, to focusing on the continuity and sustainability side. And we're seeing so many companies now having trouble with cash flow, et cetera. So that's, that's an area. Are you doing special uh, payment arrangements or anything to, you know, incentivize or to bring people on board? Um, unfortunately, um, we will always um, probably require, um, like an airline does um, with, with their direct customers, um, payment before the flight. Um, However, with bigger clients, we, we do, of course, have payment terms. Um, you know, the, the cost is what it is. You're, you're paying um, for, a, for an, a, a very bespoke uh, service. Um, it's going to be more expensive than an airline. I think the cost saving is um, filling the seats. Because when yeah. you charter an aircraft, it's the same price if you're one passenger is flying or the entire cabin. Um, we've, we've had multiple um, families come together recently um, to reduce the price, um, uh, to, to be repatriated. Um, businesses, again, looking to see if they are traveling. Perhaps um, they're, they're, uh, there's another group who, who would perhaps want to join them. We're not joining um, companies up or individuals up, but we're certainly... Um, um, we're seeing a lot of maybe uh, social jet networking um, yeah, yeah, where, exactly. where, where people yeah. are, are coming together to book charters. Yeah, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking as well, something I'll, I'll be talking to Salem about afterwards is, you know, we, we organize and we attend a lot of conferences, you know, so there might be some opportunities there for, you know, consolidating conference attendees to go in this way than multiple different flights, you know? Yeah, of course, the travel industry, it needs to have these conferences. People need to meet. Um, we're all limited by what we can do um, online. And I think everybody's, of course, making the best of it. But to, to get your, your teams to these key conferences um, and to pitch for new business, um, I think private aviation is, is, is certainly an option to consider. Yeah, no, definitely. Now, on the subject of, of risk, and obviously people assuming, and I said at the beginning, you know, one of the nicest things is to take off and obviously to land as well. And as a, as a pilot, that those are the two most stressful times of, of actually flying an aircraft. 
um, but safety and standards. You know, people sort of, there's been a lot of questions recently now about people going on to furlough and, you know, certain licensing running out and are people still being trained and will there still be the safety checks? And it's so important for consumer confidence that the one thing, irrespective of anything else, whether it's going through good times, bad times or whatever, the aviation sector is one of the safest ways to travel. And those safety um, testing, the safety standards, et cetera, are always paramount in everybody's um, minds and focus. And obviously yourself running the business, that's the same with you. Now, I understand that you guys also look at um, exceptionally high levels of, of, of safety and, uh, and certain standards. And you've got uh, Argus and Wyvern ratings. That's right. Uh, so in the, in you want to explain a little bit? I think in the States, um, the private jet customer um, who's been probably flying private for longer than we have been in Europe um, doesn't just trust the FAA uh, to, to say that an aircraft operator is, is, is safe and fit to fly them. So the two companies have, have sprung up, Wyvern and Argus, and they will independently audit aircraft operators. I have to say that also um, if we fast Tra uh, fast track the, um, the the story of private fly. We were acquired a year and a half ago by one of the largest groups in private aviation, um, a, a group called Directional Aviation, who yeah. have multiple companies, but only within the, in the private aviation space. Um, and we have uh, a safety officer in Europe and a safety officer in uh, the States, and their job is purely to audit our supply chain. So we have an accredited network of aircraft operators. So not only have they been accredited um, and, and certified by their um, aviation authority, um, yeah. but by Argus or Wyvern as, as well, and, and our, our own safety officers as well. Um, as a pilot, um, I, I've seen that, again, customers are becoming much more educated about, uh, educated about safety. Um, yes, yeah. They're understanding that safety is a combination of a well trained crew and a modern maintained aircraft. And they're asking questions around both of those. And we're only too happy to have that, those answers on hand. So, experience of the crew, not just the number of hours, but what aircraft types have they flown? What's been the background of the captain? Did they come from a military or an airline? Yeah. Uh, and, and particularly, private aviation, we. we we go to many more airports than the airlines world does. And some of these are in mountainous areas and bad weather. Um, so we, we will be selecting the aircraft operator and indeed the crew to fly that mission, um, depending on their experience. I uh, think it's, yeah, I think it's so. But I was talking to a group of guys and they were saying about something that they never did before, but they're starting to do now. And it was exactly what you said. They said that if they were going for a really important operation, They'd be checking what the hospital record was like, what the surgeon's record was like, the percentage of successes, hmm. and how that varies all over. And they said, you know, you should do the same thing when someone's taking you up so high up in the in the air and trying to bring you back down again. You want to know how good the pilot is, the preventive maintenance program on the equipment, exactly. history, and everything. You know, and and obviously there's been a few a few negative stories as there is in in every sector. Um, so it's so important. And your your websites, your communication, obviously you focus on on that sort of data. Yeah, and unfortunately the industry um, um, fights hard against illegal charter. Um, so we had the tragic death of um, Salah, the footballer, um, mm -hmm. um, which was an illegal flight. It should never have occurred. Um, it was a commercial flight. Um, and the aircraft wasn't suitable for, for night flying in, in icing conditions. The, the pilot did not have a commercial license. There was only one pilot, something that we would never do. Um, we, all of our flights have two pilots. Um, so this, this whole tragic story highlighted what we all knew in the industry was happening, um, where un, uh, poor passengers who had no idea of the danger they are in so the, the real um, lesson from this is if you're chartering, if you're entering into private aviation, whatever channel you go in and whichever company you do, make sure that the, the, the company is a member of one or two or preferably both industry associations that we have. 
So we have the European Business Aviation Association, EBAA, and we have the Air Charter Association, um, which is based um, in, the, in the Baltic Exchange here in London. Um, so make sure that the, the, the company you're booking with um, is a member of preferably both of those, and then you can go a long way to making sure that you're on a legal charter. Yeah, and I, I think that's so important. And um, the fact that, and, and the, the, oh, God bless him, the poor example that you used there, which is something that I would have brought up, is um, the fact that one would assume that between the professional clubs and being a professional footballer, that money wouldn't have been an issue. So you question yourself, how on earth did that come about and how did it happen? Yeah, I think the, the whole football um, industry needs to review and take some expert advice on how they um, look after their em em employees and associated um, uh, partners. Um, it, it should never have happened. Um, you know, when a footballer um, signs a contract, they're, they're signing that they won't um, smoke, won't take yeah. drugs, won't no go on social jumping. media. Yeah, they're, they're, they're restricted in so many ways, yet they just bought a very expensive player and allowed him um, to do something ultimately, which was um, incredibly dangerous and, and so tragically sad for the family and, and everybody who knew him. Yeah, yeah, no, no, terrible. And and the duty of care as well, which, you know, if you're taking your family, it's the same thing. You want to make sure everything is perfect. But so unfortunately, I think people think of aviation sometimes in, in the terms of a, a ski chalet or a yacht, yeah, yeah, where a friend's, yeah. got, a friend's got a boat, a friend's got a ski chalet, um, I want to go on holiday. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll borrow his, his, his house and I'll pay him mates rates. Yeah. Um, and you can't do that in private aviation. It's, it's not something that you can uh, deal with um, behind the back with a, with a, a backhand cash. It's, it's too serious for that. You have to be flying with professionals. The aircraft operator has to have an AOC. Um, the pilot's um, their history has to be known. Um, you, this is not something you can do any other way than properly. You, you, you said that you know you were part of a, a larger group. Do you, as a group, put up the do's and don'ts of private aviation? So when people are looking on a on a website or whatever, they 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 get more of an inclination or a guide as to what they should be looking for and well, we, how they should be protecting themselves. I think we're as we're quite well known brands. Our customers. Um, have that um, security when they when they come to uh, one of our companies. So Flexjet in the States offers fractional ownership. We have 180 aircraft between the States and, and Europe. Um, uh, in terms of quality, there there isn't anybody with a higher standards. And then next up, we have Sentient, which sells jet cards. Um, and again, um, we're the largest provider of jet cards and a very um, accredited list of aircraft operators and together with private fly we're we're bulletproof in terms of you know what you're getting but i think the the job is um of educating the customer it does come from individual companies but it also comes from industry associations and from the regulators and and the airports themselves so yeah. we, have, we have private airports like biggin hill um in London who are doing a fantastic job of educating customers as they come through. Um, they have a, numerous flying clubs there at the moment and, and they've um, really taken on the task of educating anybody who comes onto the airfield uh, about the dangers of, of booking an illegal charter. So I think it's, it's a job that everybody has to do, let alone the civil aviation authorities who have the power to to ramp check um, and to to work off um, um, whistleblowers and tip, yeah, yeah. Um, of which there are many, uh, and and we definitely want to see more prosecutions of of the, the players who are, who are not doing things properly. Properly, it, it's interesting, isn't it? No matter where you turn, no matter what you do, there's always there's always something or a loophole or somebody who leaps over, you know, the the difficulties that others have to comply with just to do their own business in a, in a normal way. But we're lucky private aviation is um, generally incredibly professional. They're, they're great companies, um, full of passion, 
um, full of people who want to, to make the journey seamless for the customers and not cut those corners. Um, yeah. So, of course, in, as you say, in every sector, there's a, there's a shadier side, but we're lucky that um, we've got great pillars um, in our industry. And so it's not hard for, for customers to, to find the good guys. Yeah, yeah. But I'm sure now there's going to be so much more. And, and, and obviously, I, I, you mentioned earlier about um, ski chalets and, you know, things like that. So people who want to go skiing now in the, in the season coming up, depending on what the rest of the market's like and what's going on in the industry and whether there's, you know, these, um, these corridors or bridges between countries, etc. They're going to want to do it in and out, no messing about. And um, I would imagine there's going to be a huge demand now coming up in the next few months. Yeah, I think for yeah, sure right. we will we'll come out of this um, COVID recession quicker than, than other sectors in travel. However, ultimately, private aviation, like many industries, is, is tied to the economics, uh, global exactly. economics. Um, and so that's the, the great unknown of what's the economy going to look like. Um, but we will be protected in some way. And it's interesting that we've always... Um, being able to shine when the airlines um, have disruption, and that could be because of weather, snow and ice, closing airports, um, air traffic strikes, um, pilots, um, union yep. um, working to rule. Um, whenever that happens, private aviation has, has come to the front and, and been able to fulfill um, passengers um, who, who need to fly. Um, Interestingly, in France, when the TVG, um, the trains go on strike, um, we see a surge as well. So we're not just competing um, and working with airlines. Actually, yeah. for many travelers, uh, they'll take the train now um, to avoid flying or as a, as a replacement to fly. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a, such an interesting, interesting business and interesting sector. When you sit down now on your anniversaries or whatever with your wife, what, what, what was the turning point from when you decided to start the business to say, do you know something, we've done well? Well, I think it, it came when we started employing people um, and we got the team spirit. I was lucky that um, I was in the Air Force and, uh, and really enjoyed being part of a fantastic, what well, didn't just seem like a team, you know, it did feel more like a, a family um, and, and we managed to embrace that spirit at Private Fly with our team. So I think right from the very beginning, when um, we saw the team doing jobs far better than we could, um, delivering um, great satisfaction to the clients, I think that, that was the point that we knew we were onto something when, um, when we had that team spirit. And That's that great. And I, I'm sure there'd be plenty of laughter as well. Yeah, no, we've, we've had some really great times um, with the team. Um, of course, like any growing business, it doesn't just grow linearly. You, yeah, yeah. you have um, a kind of snakes and ladders game. Um, you know, you, you ultimately know you're going to get to the top of the board, but there's a few disappointments along the way. And you know, I think it's been important to, to work together with whenever those happen. Um, and it certainly makes you stronger. Um, I wouldn't recommend necessarily going into business with your wife. Though, Chris. Um, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just thinking about that myself. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. You made, sure. made it work. Yeah, no, fair play to you. And the, and, the real, and the real good news is my mother-in-law is speaking to me again after we managed to buy back our house. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Well, yeah, that, I can imagine that one as well, yeah. But um, the reason I said about the laughter, you've got a very, very smiley face. And uh, somebody once said to me, there's little success where there is little laughter. And even in bad times, you know, if you've got a good team around you and you can laugh your way, and I don't mean that flippantly, but at least if you can stick together and laugh together, normally you'll survive together and win together. And it's, uh, it's something that's so important. So, so crucial to that is recruitment and, and making sure you take time yeah. I think when we were rapidly expanding and, and moving to the states and needing to hire people um, especially in a, in, a, in a different business environment culturally there's a there's a real tendency just to hire somebody because they they, they fit um, yeah. they fit the profile on, on paper seem to interview well but we we've always gone the kind of extra mile we've always 
flown people in for interviews, which means that they can stay overnight. We can go out for dinner, have a, a few drinks maybe, um, and get to know people. And I think that's going slow on recruitment and making sure you, you hire the right people, especially as, as we've grown the team to now 100 plus between here and the States. Um, that's one area that I've been really determined to keep control of um, in terms of wanting to speak to everybody who joins the company. I think that's wise. There's, there's many aspects um, yeah. I've been very happy to um, release control of, but recruitment, I, I still like to keep a close eye on it. Well, that's your DNA. That's your brand. That's the thing that uh, people want to see time in, time out, and they don't want to they don't want it to be different just because it's a different person or a different captain or a different person who greets them or, or you know makes the reservations. It's so I think that's so important. Yeah, and keeping the energy of that team. We of course, like everybody, is having challenges now of people working from home. Um, but we, I've been amazed by um, how we've managed to uh, to just keep that team spirit. And although we're not together uh, in an office environment. Um, we, we still do enjoy each other's company greatly. Um, it's still the, the banter, but ultimately the, the professionalism there um, and the dedication to, to find the solutions for our clients who need to fly. Yeah, no, I think it's, uh, I think it's fantastic. Well, listen, we're coming to the end of the podcast. I, I, I've learned a lot and um, I've also started looking more now at that particular sector and I'm determined, and um, I told my wife this as well, that within the next year or so, we're definitely going to give it a try. And, where would you fly to um, in the coming weeks when the restrictions lift then, Chris? Well, where I'm definitely going to go to is is, is back to Ireland because um, that's where all the family comes from. And um, I've got three brothers and we're going, to do, we're going to do a bike ride around Ireland and end up at my mother's grave because we haven't been over there for a while. So that will probably go across on the, on the, on the uh, ferry. But um, we also spend a lot of time down in Spain. So to Al- Almeria. Great. Well, two. two so we'll definitely go down there. Two destinations. And I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't uh, necessarily restrict yourself just because you've got a bike box. We've got uh, aircraft like the Citation XL, which has got yeah. plenty of cargo space. We'll fit that bike on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe. I, I, might, I might give, give them, a, yeah, I might give the boys a little... Um, a little bit of a nudge and see if we can do that it say it saved the ride all the way down to the ferry and across but uh no but definitely and what about Almeria you, you do quite a few places in Spain do you yeah Spain is uh is really opened up actually um and it's a it's a key destination um so yeah it's a longer flight um uh but uh yes very very much one of the the popular destinations um so good. We we'll look forward to welcome. Yes, you yes. I'll have to give it a try. Yeah. But listen, it's been an absolute pleasure. And um, like I said, first impressions when you see somebody on the screen, you know, you've got a very likable face. And like I said to you at the beginning, your marketing people have done a great job because the 007 position is is opening up, I understand. And from the picture that I see, you will definitely fill it. So it's it's great to hear the story. And it's so important to get some positivity at these particular times we're in now. So I thank you for that. And um, obviously we should thank your wife, I'm sure. Because yeah, I'll, she I'll, put uh, up with an awful lot. Carol uh, has been responsible for all of the marketing at Private Fly. So uh, I'll pass on those, uh, those, those great compliments. So thank you. Take care of yourself and good luck with everything. Thank you. Thanks, Chris.